Amen. Would you stand with me and turn in your Bible to Psalms 43? Psalms 43. Are you there? This is what it says from the Christian Standard Bible. Vindicate me, God, and champion my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person, for you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression. Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then I will come near, come to the altar of God, to God my greatest joy. I will praise you with the lyre, God, my God, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will stand, I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please be seated? Amen. I need you to, I need you to walk with me through this text this morning. I want to label this lesson overcoming spiritual depression, overcoming spiritual depression. You ready to go with me? Yeah. Amen. This psalm is provided to teach the people of God how to maintain sanity through seasons of despair, displacement, and oppression. It is a reminder that it is possible to live in a strange land with the power and courage to resist the temptation of exacting revenge on those who oppress, to rely on the presence of God's provision, and to rise above oppression. Psalm 43 is obviously the continuation of Psalm 42. Psalm 42 begins with the writer expressing his longing to return to church, his longing to return to the temple for worship. He says, as a deer longing for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? Whoever this writer is, and whatever circumstances they may be facing, it has kept this individual away from the place of worship. He has been separated from the people of God who gather in God's presence. I want you to notice that the refrain found in Psalms 42, 5 and verse 11 is also found in Psalm 43, 5. It says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. This refrain is the clearest sign that 42 and 43 is one unit. The content of Psalm 43 is a prayer that moves from complaint to petition and ending with hope. It's a prayer, Psalms 43. It begins with complaint, it moves to petition, and it ends in hope. The psalmist is an individual in a season of crisis in his life. He's an Israelite, an individual who is in covenant relationship with God. He is a believer and he feels that he has been wronged and he feels powerless to change his situation. He has a moral inner compass of right and wrong. It's the argument that the prophet Jer Jeremiah makes in his book, chapter 12. He says, how does a holy God, 
a God of love, allow his people to suffer while the wicked seem to thrive? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In other words, how come, says the psalmist in his living room to his wife, when I try to do the right thing, it never seems to work out in my favor. And to make matters worse, those who do wrong and know they're doing wrong seem always to be rewarded. This writer is a believer. He, he has placed his trust in God for protection and provision. He has claimed God's promises. He believes in God's word. And yet, he knows that he's been wronged. How do you handle it when you know that you've been wrong? You've been put upon, profiled, discriminated against, redlined, restricted, hated, lynched, murdered for no reason other than being who God created you to be. The writer wants to know where is God in all of this? And that's a question that many of our young people are asking this morning. With all the atrocities in my community, with all of the wrongs that have gone and are still going on, how is it that you can still come to church? Where is God in all of this? That's the question of the writer in the text. The writer wants to know where is God in all of this? And he cries out for vindication. Listen to the first verse. Vindicate me, God. Champion my cause against an unjust nation. Ref rescue me from the deceitful and unjust person. Y'all see it? There is, there is a, a series of psalms that are called imprecatory psalms. Imprecatory psalms are songs, psalms that the, the writer says, God, rise up and revenge me. It's, it's go get them. Yeah. Don't let them get away with it, God. Pour out your wrath on them. Those imprecatory songs, they... They, they are a cry for justice. That's what this is here in the text. Vindicate me. Don't you see me, God? My every movement is scrutinized. I'm harshly critiqued. I'm underpaid and overworked. I'm overlooked when opportunities arise. I'm denied access to resources. I'm dehumanized. I'm shot down. I'm shut out. I'm shamed. Vindicate me, God. As I read and entered into the text, I did experience the pathos of this psalmist. And as I did, I had to caution myself not to allow the need for vindication to drive my emotions and take control of my life. Y'all didn't hear that. As I read this and entered into the experience with the psalmist, I had to remind myself not to be driven by the need for vindication. I cannot let that take control of my life. I want to be vindicated. Yes, I need to be vindicated, but I will not allow that to take over my life. I can identify with the psalmist. I want those who wronged me, who cheated on me, who lied on me, I want them to get what they deserve. I do. I want vindication. I want reparations for the work of my great-grandfather and mother and their parents for the work that they put in on the tobacco farms in Tennessee and was never paid for it. I want the money that you owe them. That's vindication, I want that. I, I, I do, I want the professor who told me that I should go get a trade because I didn't have what it takes to finish college. I want that professor to come to my office and ask me for benevolence. 
So we all do. I, I, want, I want the person who rode up behind me doing 90 miles an hour, flashing his lights and blowing his horn because I'm only doing 75 to move over. I, wa I want that person to be a head pulled over by the state trooper getting a ticket for speeding and reckless driving and I want to drive by real slow. And look in his eyes. Vindication. And don't look at me funny. Because you know you have that in your too. But be careful and prayerful because the need for vindication can make you bitter. It can make you hateful. It can make you angry. And nothing good comes from anger. The drive for vindication can make you vulnerable. It can claim all of your attention and dominate your thinking, and it will blind you to God's will and God's work in your present situation. So don't be driven by vindication. I understand it. I embrace it, but I have to let it go. You can't be driven by hatred. And so he moves into the second part of the prayer. The next movement is petition. This is a man of God. This is a person who has a relationship with the living God. He knows that God is real. And he knows from his past experience that God will show up. And so do you. You know from past experience, from your walk with God, that God shows up and he's never late. He's always on time. Have I got a witness this morning? And so he moves into, into prayer, verses 2 and 3. For you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go through about in sorrow because of my enemy's oppression? And then he says... Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God, my greatest joy. I will praise you with the leer, God. So notice here, before he makes a petition, he makes a statement. You are the God of my refuge. It's a prayer to God who is, who is our strength. My trust is in you, God. Like, I'm limited to what I can do. I've done everything that's in my power to do, but I need some more. I need something else that's beyond me, and I have trusted in you. I trust you, God. You see this situation. You understand my condition. I need you to do something. You are not moving right now, but I trust you, God. After all, whom have I in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I like the way Isaac Watts said it. We used to sing it in the church. Oh, God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. That's calling on a power that's beyond you. James Weldon Johnson said, God of our weary years. God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. We need something that's beyond us. We don't have enough guns. We don't have enough bullets. We don't have an army. We don't have a militia. We don't need any of that because we have the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of hosts. Y'all remember that? You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? I said it before, I got to say it again. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus at the table, he said, how many swords we got at the table? They said, we got two. 
He said, it's enough. Then he was arrested. And somebody, Peter, pulled out his sword and tried to use it. And Jesus says, put it away. You can put that away. If I needed an army, all I have to do is call. And an army will appear. We need resources that's beyond what we have. And we have everything we need in God. Our petition is to God. Not because we are afraid of conflict, but because our battle is a spiritual one. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Our welfare, our warfare is not carnal. Y'all need to hear me this morning. Our enemy is Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the diametric opposite of God. Satan controls the unrepented heart of men and women. Y'all want to know who's behind the murder in Jackson this morning? You want to know who's behind? It's not that kid that was used by Satan. It's the forces of evil that inhabited that kid, not only to take lives of other people, but to take his own life. That is demonic. Our warfare is not flesh and blood. is spiritual. Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. He is the source of hatred and malice. And he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And for this reason, the psalmist is praying for strength and resources that only God can provide. Listen to what he's asking for. Lord, send your light and your truth and let them lead me. He didn't ask for AK-47. He didn't ask for a nine millimeter. He didn't ask for body armor. He said, Lord, send your light and your truth and let them lead me. Now, you see, you have to be spiritual for this. This, You know, this is not for people who go to church. This, This ain't for you. This is for people who are the church. This is for you. Lord, send me your light and your truth. Light and truth are metaphors that points to God's presence and God's word. Light suggests God's glorious presence. Light suggests God's glory and pres- glorious presence. It's a metaphor used throughout scripture, like the burning bush on the backside of the desert that burned and was not consumed. That's God's presence, that's light. Like the shining presence of God that filled the tent of meetings that made Moses' face shine. That's that's light. Light like the pillar of fire that led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. That's light. Send your light, your light and your truth, which is the spoken word by Moses and the prophets. The psalmist is petitioning God for light and truth, and so should we. The petition was answered in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. Jesus declared himself to be the light of the world. John says in him, there is no darkness at all. Through Jesus, God provides the illumination and the guidance that we need to navigate this gloomy, dark world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily form. He is the light of God's presence, and he is God's truth. The truth is in Christ, and the truth is Christ. The truth about God is in Christ. God, our creator, came to redeem, to reconcile, and to restore his fallen human creation. The truth is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. The truth is that Jesus died on the cross. It was God's plan for redemption. The truth is that Jesus, by the determinate counsel of God, was arrested in the garden, falsely convicted, declared guilty when he had no guilt at all, sentenced to death by religion and politics. He was nailed to the cross on Friday, and there he died. The truth is that the sky darkened at midday, the earth quaked and gray were open. The veil in the temple was torn in two. His dead body was claimed by Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus' body was washed and wrapped in a clean linen. He was laid in a newly hewn tomb. He was laid there until the Sabbath ended and then early Sunday morning God raised him from the dead. The truth is that he has been given all authority in heaven and earth. The truth is that he ascended to heaven according to scripture and is now seated at the right hand of power and he is coming again the truth is that all who put your faith in him have been reconciled to god the wall of separation has been demolished and the image of god in you has been restored thank god for grace thank god for light thank god for truth thank god for jesus the truth is, my brothers and sisters, that in the midst of despair and crisis, there is still God's persistent love and trustworthiness. Amen. When things fall apart all around you and me, situations sometimes go awry. People sometimes try to drag you down. But in those times, God is still on the throne. And we're reminded in the word by Job, whose life was falling all apart, but his trust in God never wavered. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Or remember the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter three, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I wonder if there's anybody here in the midst of a crisis in your life. Refuse to let that crisis steal your joy away. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I know him like I know him. I'm glad that I've walked with him for these many years. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is able to bring you through. Do I have any witnesses in the house this morning? Then give God some praise. Habakkuk said, the Lord is my strength and he makes my feet like deer's feet. You ever seen a mountain goat walk on the side of a mountain? He doesn't need much ledge, but God has given him the wherewithal so that he can traverse the dangers of a mountain. And God has given that to you. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. They that trust in the Lord will renew your strength. Amen. Amen. Psalm 43. Let me move. I got to finish. Psalm 43 concludes with the psalmist having been led by the truth and light of God's word into the very presence of God. Let me, you and I must understand that when scripture talks about God's word, it's talking about the logos. It's talking about the word made flesh. 
is talking about Jesus. So when you hear the preacher talking about God's word, you and I need to understand that it transcends the ink and paper of this book. This book can be manipulated. This book can be used for evil and good. When the Bible is talking about God's word, it's talking about the living word. When it talks about inerrancy, it's talking about Jesus. I'm going to give you a minute with that because I just said that for the first time myself. I'm going to need a minute with that. But see, there's an attack on the word of God. And even some learned individuals are finding ways to critique this book. And I respect your individuality. I respect your intellect. I respect your your, your, your learning, I respect your research, I respect all of that. But when I talk about the word of God being inerrant, I'm talking about the life of Jesus. You got that? I'm talking about the life of Jesus. So you can say that the Bible, uh, I read it from cover to cover, and it contradicts itself. Yeah, well, you might say that, but Jesus never contradicted himself. You can say, well, well, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, it was inspired by God, uh, but uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. So you can attack the book all you want to. I'm still going to use the book because it's still inspired by God. I still plan to teach the people of God where the book came from, how to read it, how to interpret it, how to apply it. I'm going to do all of that. But the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Say what you want on me. But if Jesus ain't in it, I ain't with it. Okay. I want you to notice this, this, there's an important point here that when you read this text, you will discover that it was in worship that the psalmist's hope was restored. That it was in worship. You can't do it by yourself. In seasons of crisis, we tend to separate from ourselves. We, did, we tend to go into isolation and fear. The psalmist's hope is renewed and his resolve is revived as he participates in worship with other people in the temple. Look at verse four. Then I will come to the altar of God. To God, my greatest joy, I will praise you with the leer. And my God, my God, why has my soul dejected me? Listen to the last point. Put your hope in God. For I will still praise him. My savior and my God. So young people who are asking the question, where is God and why are we still in church? That's why. Because our hope is in him. And we still praise him. Listen, it's natural to be tempted toward despair and discouragement. Despite our feelings, we know that God is faithful and he will vindicate his people in his own time. For that reason, we are encouraged to put our trust in him. The good news, that's good news for our culture of anxiety and isolation and despair. Let me close with Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. 
The war may rise against me, and this I will be confident. One thing have I desired that I may seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore will I give sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing praises to the God. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. This psalmist is saying, I will praise God under every circumstance. You can't stop me from singing. I will sing songs of joy. Somebody said, preacher, why will you sing? I'm glad you asked. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, I know he watches me. Hey man, anybody know that he watches you? He watches over you. He watches over your children. He watches over your house. He watches over your spouse. He watches over your friends. I know he watches me. I'm going to say right there, Pastor, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh, is I is all. The sparrow. You gotta help me with this one, y'all. And I know he watches. He watches me. How many of you believe that? If you really believe that God, stand on your feet and give God some praise. If you really believe that God is watching over you, that God has your best interest at heart, then you ought to give him some praise. Hey! Ain't God all right? He's all right. He's all right, I tell you. You ought to give him a try. I dare you to trust him. I dare you to trust him. I dare you to trust him. Is there anybody here that God has brought all the way? All the way. All the way. Amen. 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 